Tonight's presentation, although edited for YouTube, contains imagery and subject matter some may find disturbing. While our program is educational, we still feel that viewer discretion is advised. Now, it's true that one of the Columbine shooters did say that his crime would resemble Doom. He also said in the same sentence that it would resemble the atrocities of the Vietnam War. But the Columbine tragedy was not caused by the exposure of teenagers to video games. It was caused by the exposure of two mentally unstable individuals to a society that they hated. To take their actions as representative of all teenagers is no more justified than to take the actions of the 9-11 hijackers as representative of all Muslims. Both of these are rational fallacies and both of them, if not that's a clip from a pro video game rally in 2010, around the same time when everyone's favorite Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger, tried to put limitations on what a video game can and can't say. Little did he know that video games are one of the best mediums to convey everything from a political message to a heartfelt emotional tale. Because of games' most defining trait, interactivity, it makes them the perfect choice to deliver some of the most disturbing and unnerving content around. Indie titles, more so than mainstream games, are not limited to focus groups or publisher compromises, making them some of the best vectors for singular pointed visions, which ultimately leads to some of the most gritty, disturbing, uncompromising, creepy stories in the entire industry. With a a few mixed results. So with that being said, sit back, relax, and turn down the lights and prepare to be scared as I present 21 of the most disturbing indie games around. The last time this channel discussed the Lisa games, we took a look at the most well-known entry in the series, Lisa the Painful. However, did you know it was actually the second game in the series? The first game came out in 2012 and was titled Lisa the First. The two games, despite being from the same series, differ in many ways. Instead, it takes on a more Yume Nikki inspired gameplay experience with no combat and a silent protagonist. It is also considerably shorter than the others in the series. You play as Lisa Armstrong, the titular young girl, in a time before her, spoiler alert, eventual suicide that would soon be depicted in the following game. You're able to explore her mind as she copes with her sexually and physically abusive father, Marty. Oh, this game doesn't let you forget Lisa's constant abuse. Deformed monsters taking on the look of her father, nauseating world textures, and not so subtle phallic imagery await you at every turn. What makes this game so tragic is the constant reminder of how hopeless Lisa feels under her father's hurtful hands. And this was how she felt before she took her own life. Freedom is nowhere in sight. And since her brother is not anywhere in the picture, she's completely alone in the world to deal with Marty. Her home is littered with trash, mold, and broken glass. Yet her father doesn't care. When he's not physically or sexually abusing her, he's neglectful of her physical health. All he cares about is his alcohol and his TV. It's no wonder Lisa has to resort to these psychedelic breakdowns to escape reality. But even then, her father still seeks into her pores, rotting her mind away with each painful lash she experiences. Even without the story, the game still makes up one of the most uncomfortable gaming experiences you can find. The soundtrack can only be described as nauseating, consisting of catchy tunes such as several TV audio records being blared at once and ominous several note loops that just feel claustrophobic. This, coupled with the grotesque backgrounds, makes you not too surprised that this is how Lisa's mind has been deformed from her abuse. Even at the end of the game, when you're still hoping, praying that Lisa can escape this life of abuse, you are reminded that there is no escape, no happy ending. This is her life, and it will be until the day she dies. Marty will never let her go, because life is cruel, and as the following games dive into, very painful for Lisa Armstrong.
The story of Masao involves a girl who mysteriously goes missing, and three months later, several of her classmates talk about how she was bullied by everyone around her. And at the same time, strange and deadly incidents have been jokingly blamed on her ghost, known as the Masao's Curse. This game was created using the RPG Maker program, and it was created by Sen, with similar gameplay elements to Aoni. Masao is a horror RPG title with many story elements pointing towards a theme of the effects of bullying and depression, and even sexual abuse, with a very anime take on it. We don't need to go much further than that. The story this game tells is a supernatural horror that features very screwed up events that most people won't be able to relate to. But the disturbing thing is, outside of the ghosts and spirits, the underlying tale about sexual abuse and trauma is still very possible, and is something that is very hard to watch. Considering it's only $3 on Steam, if you're mature enough to handle it, give it a look. Notes of Obsession is a freeware game developed by 17 Swedish gaming development students, all made in the span of 10 weeks. It places the player in the role of a woman in her upper middle class Swedish home, where all seems normal enough. She is lured from her cushy living room up to a child's room by a mysterious vintage music box sitting on the dresser. Which is odd, considering how much it clashes with the rest of the house's decor. Once the music box is found, the woman begins to hallucinate strange symbols appearing on the walls when the music plays. You must locate symbols scattered around the environment in order to progress through each room. However, with each room you go through, the house becomes more decrepit and you begin to get a feel that you're not really alone. It feels like something is following you, creeping from behind and occasionally slamming doors or pounding on the walls. To talk about the gameplay any further goes into spoiler territory, and the ending is a powerful one for such a short game without any dialogue. It carries a chilling atmosphere of building horror leading up to the final climax of the story. The puzzle mechanic of the music box is also interesting, and who doesn't love a good old fashioned creepy music box in the children's room for a horror game? It's hard for someone like me to talk about a game like this. You see, I used to love Telltale games, and I had a policy of buying one after another the moment they got announced. The Walking Dead, The Wolf Among Us, and even Borderlands. I loved them all, until they released Minecraft Story Mode, and the less they say about that, the better. I just hated what the games were starting to become. Walking Dead 2 and 3 were enjoyable, but then the company shut down right before it got back into my favorite series, The Wolf Among Us. These kinds of games suck you in through story and minor decision making, and in the early days, if you made a mistake, people would die, others would become outright hostile, and it was all about the kind of story you wanted to craft. Telltale kind of lost that when they employed the new policy of illusion of choice as opposed to actual choice. In the early days, when you offended people, they would be mad at you, and it would affect about how the story played out. While in the end, Lee is going to die, and Clementine is going to be left alone or with some other survivors, how you got there was significantly different. The tension was entirely up to you and the decisions you made. And that's what brings me to Oxenfree. Oxenfree is a game that has taken the telltale concept to the next logical step. You can interrupt people mid-conversations, remaining silent and letting them talk is also much more of a valid option than it was in the old Telltale games, and your choices have a lot more weight upon how people look at you in this iteration. All the while you're enjoying this fun story full of teen angst, drama, and neurosis. They also introduce a supernatural subplot that threatens to kill you and your party of misfit friends. However, by the end of the game, the thing that's gonna disturb you the most is not the ghosts or depictions of suicide or any of the other creepy happenings on the island, but rather, it's the horror of realizing that sometimes people drift apart and trauma can not only just build bridges, but also can burn some down. 
Sometimes you go through an ordeal with a friend, it strengthens that bond. However, sometimes it just makes it so that they can't relate to you anymore. By the end of the game, I somehow made my stepbrother want nothing to do with me. My pot-smoking best friend date another girl who also wanted nothing to do with me. And then also another person who was hanging out with us on the island that I tried to make friends with ended up wanting nothing to do with me. Even after I tried to make every decision that would save everyone in our group, they all drifted apart. Yes, the ghosts that infect time like a parasite and possesses your friends to make them do horrible things like jumping off of a building or killing themselves in various horrifying ways is kind of creepy. But the real knee kicker here was the fact that after the game was done, my player character was left alone after such a horrifying existential experience. All because I, the player, had to make tough choices that didn't pan out well. This game no lying at all at the end brought me to tears some people like to say that traumatic experiences can bring people together but like me and many other people know and like this game states trauma can oftentimes tear people apart through the game's narrative the subjects of divorce death suicide and trauma are explored in great detail throughout the entire game Really, there is two plot lines that run through the center of the narrative. The personal story between Alex, Jonas, and her family, which grounds the player into the world, and also includes her great ensemble of well-acted friends. Then there's this supernatural story, which talks about the history of the Adlers, and this sunken submarine that was blown up and killed 83 naval officers through, get this, friendly fire. This lingering feeling of regret, anger, and injustice leaves them tied to this island and, well, needs to possess you and your friends in order to escape this hell of constantly reliving those final moments over and over again. This game can be stressful and it can be deeply disturbing watching your friends die over and over again through drowning, jumping off of buildings, and many other horrific methods of suicide, leaving you questioning your own sanity from time to time. And in the end, depending on the choices you make, you can find yourself all alone by the end of the narrative. It preys upon fears of anxiety, depression, and the fear of losing everything due to factors that sometimes are quite literally outside of your control. And I don't know about you, but saying goodbye and wallowing in those lingering feelings for a prolonged period of time is deeply disturbing to me. The gaming world was devastated when Konami decided to drop their critically acclaimed demo of Silent Hill PT in addition to letting go of the series' lead director, Hideo Kojima. However, in 2016, a demo for a new horror game that had taken heavy inspiration from PT was released for Steam Greenlight, being named RE77. Since it is still in demo, not much can be said about the actual plot of the game beyond pure speculation. You play as a silent protagonist as they wander down a hallway of a house littered with children's drawings. However, when you reach the door at the end of the hallway, you're right back where you started. Thus, you continue to wander aimlessly through this one hall as subtle changes begin to take place throughout the confined space. Objects are moved or replaced. Ominous writing appears on the wall, and the hallway gets progressively darker. It almost makes one question their own sense of reality, if things were like this the last time you walked down the corridor. As you continue to progress through, this becomes much more distorted as the line between reality and nightmarish horror blurs. Near the end, you begin to hear radio broadcasts that set up future plot points in the game, along with the vague imagery scattered throughout the house. The best way to experience what this demo truly has to offer is to play it for yourself. It perfectly captures what the stillborn project of Silent Hill PT could have been like, and its sense of atmospheric horror without any jump scares is a rare commodity in the horror game industry.
Cry of Fear. This one's a real throwback. If you were watching YouTube, or more specifically Let's Plays from 2012, you'd remember this game. So, allow me to take you through this particularly nostalgic horror trip. Cry of Fear is a critically acclaimed horror game, often said to be one of the best horror games of the early 2010s, starting as a mod for the game Half-Life 2, though it would evolve into its own project. The game allowed you to take control of Simon, a young Swedish man left wounded and scarred after a car accident. Upon waking up, you begin to see extremely deformed, ravenous human-like creatures that want nothing more than to crack your neck open and drink it like a can of Pepsi. Through the game, you meet insane medical professionals, horrific creatures, and childhood friends in an ever-evolving story that takes up many chapters. The way you play affects the ending you may receive. The dreary, shadow-obsessed gameplay, often coupled with the game's world atmosphere, as the Silent Hill inspirations are worn very clearly on its sleeve. But hey, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Silent Hill is a goddamn classic after all. Hallucinations, memories, and of course depression are all underlying fears as Simon gets flashbacks towards doctors and therapy. Due to the availability of the title, it is highly recommended, as mere words cannot describe the horrific and heart-pounding tension this game provides. Best played in a dark room, really late at night. Little Nightmares is a puzzle platformer horror title developed by Tarsier Studios. As with Layers of Fear, it has a consistent state of public availability, being available for PlayStation 4, Nintendo Switch, and Xbox One. The game has since received extremely positive reviews, with critics praising the brilliantly disturbing but somehow alluring atmosphere, graphics, and story. Speaking of the story, you play as Six, a hungry little girl, as she is forcibly carried out to sea by a dark and mysterious vessel called the Maw. The Ma is filled to the brim with obese creatures, often referred to as guests, most of which seem hostile to the player. After she finally escapes the harsh confines of the ship, she soon becomes stalked by the long-armed blind jander, who is tasked with capturing runaway children. While exploring the dark and dreary world of the Ma, you must always stay aware of your surroundings, since avoiding certain death at the hands of the various monsters blocking your path to freedom isn't exactly as easy as tying your shoes. You'll be forced to use your instincts if you ever want to escape your seabound prison. Using your trusty lighter to light the path of salvation, you must use everything to your benefit to escape the many guests on board of the Ma. Though you meet many horrifying and distorted creatures on your adventure, one stands out, and she is simply known as the Lady, a slender female character wearing a Japanese-style outfit and mask. She is often subtitled as the Watchful Eyes, as she has been watching Six progress through the ship. Before I continue to give the ending of Little Nightmares away, here's a spoiler warning. Sp spoiler warning. The Lady can be pinned as the main antagonist of the game, as she is the last opponent Six must face on her journey. The Lady, who appears to be egotistical and vain in nature, seems to avoid mirrors at all costs. Six finds this out, and eventually uses one to weaken the Lady in the final stretch of the game. Defeated, she collapses to the floor, motionless, and Six devours her whole. I told you she was one hungry little girl. After doing so, Six takes on the Lady's powers, and the game comes to a close. The Lady seems to be the main topic of discussion for theorists trying to piece together a coherent story. Many people theorize that the Lady may be Six's mother, or that she's the god of the twisted world Six lives in. What do you think? If you haven't played Little Nightmares yet, go out and do so. It's an amazing experience I think any horror lover should play. This is another game made in Wolf RPG editor by Yuri. The story of The Crooked Man is a story of David Hoover, a troubled man who just bought an apartment when the whole world goes to crap, and his darkest fears come to the forefront. Much like other games made with the RPG Maker engine, the gameplay is mostly puzzle solving and item gathering as you progress through the story. The game manages to really make you feel the pressure and hardship of David's situation by doing so with a compelling story that gets you through the abundance of gameplay hiccups and, admittedly, overuse of jump scares. The overall disturbing atmosphere though is still intact and is enough to, at least for me, get me through the story at a breakneck pace so I can overlook some of the admittedly obvious scares awaiting. In summary, The Crooked Man is about how David, the protagonist, 
and the Crooked Man are very much similar characters to one another, except one of them actually committed suicide and had come back from the dead. David and his friends have become victims of this Crooked Man, in that they all remind the antagonist of his own life, and the Crooked Man just wants to forget the past, not by moving on or growing emotionally, but by taking out these lingering emotions on the cast of characters, much like a Japanese horror film. He wants to kill them in an attempt to get rid of anything similar in his afterlife. He's a vengeful spirit after all. Your job in the game is to discover the past and find a way to bring peace to this vengeful spirit. So the deeper and underlying meaning of the Crooked Man is that David is dealing with this horrible bout of depression. Anyone who's been through thoughts of suicide can certainly relate, and it's the kind of horror that really sticks with you if you're the right person. David's life has kind of grounded him into the dirt, starting with his mother being hospitalized into Alzheimer's, and his girlfriend leaving him at just the wrong moment. I mean, his friends are there to try to help him out as they get him an apartment so he can sort through his life and try to move on. The problem is that sometimes in life, there are more terrifying things in the world than just emotional demons to overcome. Sometimes, they're one and the same. Haha, <laughs> looks like you've made it this far into the video and I still haven't mentioned Night in the Woods. Look, if you saw my last video on Night in the Woods, you know why I find this game disturbing. Night in the Woods is an example of how horror can be used not only just to entertain yourself, but also help you work out your own issues by putting a mirror to your own reality, and help you understand just a bit more about yourself so that you can be better by the end of the experience. For a quick summary for those who haven't seen my last video on it, Night in the Woods is about coming home in order to escape the harsh reality of college life, only to find a domestic horror hiding right under your own floorboards in your own neighborhood. Instead of finding comfort, our main protagonist, May, only finds that everything has changed, people have moved on without her, and by extent, are leaving her alone with her own anxiety and feelings to work through. Night in the Woods touches upon everything from cosmic horror to more existential fears, and furthermore, it saved my life. If you want to learn more about that story, uh, you can always pick it up on Steam or Switch for $20, or watch my last video on it, where I discuss how it, honest to God, may be one of the best, most enriching pieces of media I've ever consumed in my life. Life After Us, The System, drops the player off in an abandoned mental asylum with the task of finding an old woman named Mrs. Hemington's granddaughter. The girl is described as having the mind of a child due to severe mental illness, and recently has escaped back to the asylum where she was once held. While mental asylums are meant to help the mentally sick, unfortunately, they can be rotten inside and mistreat their patients, as this girl learned the hard way. The player finds several of her notes scattered around the asylum that talks about her mistreatment from the asylum staff. The most horrifying part about these notes is uncovering the rather disgusting sexual abuse the girl suffered from a man named Dr. Tar. As you continue to progress through the game and find more notes, the girl's story becomes more and more heart-wrenching. Just the thought of someone being so sick and twisted that they would take advantage of a mentally ill girl for their own sexual pleasure is just revolting on so many levels. And it's not like you're able to do anything about it either. All you can do is keep reading notes about events that already happened and wonder when this depressing life of the poor girl will end, or at least when you can escape the asylum. Chances are you've most likely heard of this game. It's critically acclaimed and constant re-releases have ensured a consistent state of public availability. So, whether you're on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Steam, or Nintendo Switch, you can play Lair of Fear. Now, I'm here to tell you why you should go ahead and do that. Layers of Fear 
has one of the best atmospheres of any horror game, creating a surrealist, mind-bending experience only possible with today's technology. You play as a wounded painter as he walks around his home and begins to slowly lose his mind. Doors appear and vanish on a whim. Stuff moves on its own, and well, let's just say the many distorted and unnerving portraits that follow you along the walls don't help your situation very much. I mean, look at these things. They're fucking terrifying. The game's uses of shadows and very slight, extremely subtle changes to the environment can surely lead you deep into a maze of paranoia. You'll be freaking out at the sound of your own footsteps by the end of the game. Finding each note left by the NPCs, of which you can't help but feel some inner fear of, and clues into the overarching story is a sheer delight and will awaken the inner voice of any completionist. The multiple endings, each with their own monsters and gut-clenching scares, will lead just about any horror aficionado to bite their nails. The warped and unstable painter searches to finish his masterpiece. Each winding stairway of madness makes you wonder if he even should. The story paints, <laughs> paints a picture of obsession, going above and beyond what a normal person should do pushing and even punishing those who we love and who love us in the pursuit of artistic integrity. It's a story that has been passed around through the ages, but will always be relevant, as even the most common of us can find ourselves rocking back and forth. Insanity can be contagious that way, as madness will transmit from the on-screen character to the player. You may need to leave your lights on after playing this. The Graveyard is not your standard horror game. There are no jump scares, no real demons, zombies, vampires, or spooky scary skeletons blocking your path. To sum it up, this game really doesn't have much. It does fall into the controversial subgenre of games, often called, even in mocking, walking simulators. A game where there isn't much of an objective. It plays out as more of an interactive art piece. And for that reason alone, the game has gathered controversy. Some calling it an unnerving and somewhat beautiful experience, while others may refer to it as simply being pretentious. Enough talk though. What is this game? Well, you play as an unnamed old woman who's taking a lonely, somber walk through a graveyard. Almost everything is in black and white, almost in a noir style, as a soundtrack of mostly silence plays. I say mostly because the occasional bird chirp or dog bark can be heard. Not a single bird or dog can be spotted, however. What you do see is a bench. Right about here, you have two choices, both extremely thrilling. Sit, or not to sit. If you sit, a song slowly devours the silence, a pulsing lo-fi track detailing the life of a woman, the people she knew, and the people in her life who had since passed. This is a game about lamenting. Its slow pace is deliberate, while listening to the somber tone, which is sung entirely in Dutch, by the way, your character may suddenly die. No bells or whistles, no grandiose ending. Just death. It's monotonous, yes, but it can lead you feeling a strange sense of dread and distress. It seemingly accomplishes more in a simple premise than most other games can with elaborate million dollar budgets. Sometimes. A real way of striking fear is to simply leave it all up to the player. Have them make of it what they will. Papers, Please is a single-player dystopian document thriller in which a player steps into the role of a immigration inspector in the fictional country of Vastrotska, which is very reminiscent of the Soviet Union, if I'm not mistaken. It also doesn't help that this game is set in the year 1982. The game is grounded in realism, so much in fact that it actually might seem mundane to those who are watching gameplay and those who first hear about it. However, because of the role you play, a unique perspective on this mundane task is given. Not only that, but it allows for the game to tell a story in a very unique and unorthodox way. It being grounded in such a way as how it grips you. Let me explain. You're located on the border between two very different countries as you assign whether or not people can immigrate to your native country of origin. 
With each mistake you make, a few dollars gets wiped off your paycheck. You can't exactly allow everyone to enter the country and have a day's pay wiped, can you? It's a game of balance and feels uniquely human as it creates a juxtaposition that is both new and interesting. Based on what I'm showing and what I've said, it may seem that this game has a very much a lack of story, but that's where you'd be wrong. The previously mentioned unique perspective is exploited in a way where it feels like the game is literally emotionally manipulating the player. I know that sounds crazy, but please allow me to explain. Now, please forgive any mispronunciations going forward as I cannot find good pronunciations on a lot of the words I'm about to say. Um, Ripiel Pascana wants to enter Astrotska, the country you're tasked with protecting. Everything looks up to date, date of birth, entrance, deadline, passport expiration. His explanation for entering matches up exactly with his work permit, which seems to be completely legit, as you flip through your guidebook to verify the passport's issuing city, and as you're looking it over, yeah, that seems to check out too, so everything checks out, his weight seems to be in order, and he doesn't appear to be a smuggler, so you click the green approve stamp over the passport, push the documents back over the desk, Two weeks later, you're having yourself a good look at today's wanted criminals list, a spot that Rip Yul is on the top of that list. Oh shit, that's five fewer dollars that you'll have to pay rent and feed your kids. You somehow feel the implications of your wrongdoing, and this game likes to test you on your own morality. Like there's this person who clearly can't make their way in, but has been disconnected from their family due to recent changes in border disputes. So do you let them in and sacrifice a couple of bucks off of your own table? Or do you deny them, condemning them? There's a lot of moral questions that you must ask yourself, all wrapped in the veneer of not nearly making enough money to even make sure your own are okay. Which leads you to maybe taking background deals or accepting money under the table, which shows how corrupt the system actually can be. I could go on and on about how the game weighs you down in a emotional pressure, but this segment's long enough, and if you haven't already bought the game, I recommend you pick this little indie title up. I don't think it's that much on Steam. This is yet another game created by Sen and the Wolf RPG editor. Matt Father is about a young girl named Aya, and eventually finds out the truth behind her father's profession. The gameplay mainly involves puzzle solving and item gathering, just like the many other RPG Maker games on this list. However, Matt Father works hard within its extremely limited gameplay to create a dark atmosphere. That allows for satisfying jump scares and some extremely disturbing death scenes, most of which are performed on little Aya. Children dying in any context will always be a touchy, disturbing topic to discuss in any community, let alone a video game where you take control of said child. The story of Mad Father is about this little girl's dad, who is a scientist that specializes in human experimentation. His wife dies under mysterious circumstances, and with it, a horrible curse befalls the mansion. This ultimately concludes into an ending that leaves you with a sense of loss, but mostly it just leaves you with a bad taste in your mouth. For the more empathetic, it might even make you cry. So, what could really be scary about an RPG game with the graphical depth of a 2009 Newgrounds cartoon? Atmosphere and panic. Using its admittedly low amount of resources, Madfather uses its extreme shock factor and pacing to put the player in a tense, constant state of suspense and tension. The sound design uses sickening noises to create a real sense of discomfort. This combined with its story and the disturbing subtext behind it really creates an unnerving experience. I mean, you're playing a young girl with an angry dad. It capitalizes on some primal fears of powerlessness against a terrifying, unstoppable enemy through the lens of what's known as domestic horror.
Hello? Hell. Oh. May have a horrid, unreadable title, but don't allow that to deter you from one of the most creative and honestly captivating RPG Maker games out there. Yes, this is indeed a game made with RPG Maker. However, unlike plenty of other games that use that software as a virtual playground, this one uses its retro-inspired graphics to its advantage. But the game's real strong suit is its playstyle and its collection of endings. Yes, I said collection of endings. This game has a total of 31 of them, making it an expansive and overall replayable experience you'll return to, even just to see how different each outcome can be. Some will last a couple seconds, leaving you puzzled at what just happened. Some will leave you on the edge, waiting for the next event to blow you away in surprise. However, some will and some won't. It's a mixed bag, like that bag of snack mix sitting in your cupboard. You might need to eat a few tasteless pretzels before you can get to one of those M&M-like candies. This game is truly an underrated gem, with many twists and turns that weave a twisted tale of loss, spirits, and f f phones. Yes, phones play a large role somehow. Um, <clears throat> as much as I would love to go into deep detail about the multiple paths your playthrough may take, saying more would be a spoiler. It would simply kill any and all playability. Most of the fun is how the game doesn't directly tell you what's happening, as the game keeps the underlying story hidden throughout. The story can only be weaved through clues left out for the player to explore in their own way, which for some games may be a hindrance, but here it adds to the appeal. Check it out for yourself. I mean you can't get any cheaper than free. Developed by Mortis Ghost as one of the rare French games to become popular in the freeware indie horror game community, Off is an oddball out of the pool of RPG Maker games swimming around on the web. To put it simply, if you were to play any RPG Maker game on this list, I'd probably recommend this one to go first. This game is really weird, and because of that, it's actually grown decently in size and fanbase. The monochromatic color setting is strange. The characters from talking cats to laughing men and frog masks are just unsettling, and the plot is so vague and confusing right for picking apart for any sort of theorist out there. The battle system is nothing to scoff at either. It's a traditional RPG turn-based system, as with most RPG Maker games. And you level up through experience and use items to make the protagonist and his allies stronger. The game follows an enigmatic humanoid named Only the Batter and his quest to quote-unquote purify the four zones of the world. The zones represent a different part of society, such as civilian areas, factories, and mines that all revolve around interesting elements. In this world, the four elements, unlike in reality, are meat, plastic, smoke, and metal. Because uh, that makes sense. Each zone is crawling with specters for the batter to defeat to save people living there, as well as a guardian to serve as the big boss of each zone. So alright creepy, let, let, let's get this out, what, what's so creepy about this game again? While the game doesn't sound too ominous outside of the visuals, it begins to get creepy once you really think about the plot and gameplay. The game starts off as the plot says the batter is tasked with eliminating the monsters that are attacking the workers, named the Elson. Though soon, the Elson begin to beg for their lives, pleading for the batter just to leave them alone and let them do their work. The batter doesn't seem to care, he's willing to cut down anyone and everyone who stands in his way to purify the land, and let me say, I do feel a little Hitlery saying the word purify so much. And between the game's actual narrative and art style, that's the kind of imagery that keeps getting invoked, at least for me. And it doesn't matter if they're actually attacking you, if they're a attacking specter or an innocent Elson, the batter will just kill them, and there's nothing that will stop them. The player, as a character, is actually thrusted into the role of an omniscient god who controls the batter, who in turn controls the fate of the land. It and other characters are aware of you as the player's presence, as the one who's puppeteering all these events, and they have no qualms of making you feel guilty about all of it. All the choices the batter makes are your choices. You're choosing to brutally murder innocent workers and their guardians. All for your own moral conquest to make the world pure. 
You've always had the option to turn off the game, yet you choose to complete the baddest quest. Which, at least to me, upon first playing through this game and experiencing its narrative for the very first time, which is honestly one of the first times I've really seen it done well before games like Undertale decided to make you feel bad for playing the game. All I have to say is that when I first played through this game, it left a visceral impact on me. And for all that is said and done, it was pretty damn disturbing. Hello Neighbor is the debut title of Russian developers Dynamic Pixels. The game, despite having an art style akin to a crappy Pixar knockoff, touches on some very dark subjects, ranging from how childhood trauma can linger into adulthood to the effects that death can have on one's psyche. This game, though critically panned, should be praised for its genius and inventive storytelling. The gameplay may be uninspired, boring, downright unfair at times, but as with most horror games nowadays, it's an afterthought. The appetizer leading up to the main meal. Let me explain as best I can. The game is separated by three acts. Act 1 starts with our young protagonist as he chases the ball down a steep hill. Missing persons flyers litters the streets as they pass by, foreshadowing what's to come for our young protagonist. His ball then lands on the yard of a strange mustached man. The official novels, uh, because that needs to exist, gives him the name Mr. Peterson. So for simplicity's sake, I'll refer to him as such. Our protagonist looks through a window to find Mr. Peterson aggressively shoving what can be presumed to be a person down the stairs of his basement, before locking and boarding the basement door. The player, filled with courage, curiosity, and the will to help, sneaks in and tries to find a way into the basement. It doesn't take long until he's thrown into the basement himself. Doesn't seem you're the first to be trapped there, as empty food and drink containers and an old, dirty pallet litter the basement floor. Our protagonist lays on the pallet, drifting off to sleep as Act 1 comes to a close. Act 2 is primarily made up of dream sequences, one that paint Mr. Peterson as a more tragic than despicable character. These dream sequences act as more of a backstory told by confusing symbolism to explain why Mr. Peterson is the way he is. The first of these sequences show Mr. Peterson and whom we can only assume to be Mrs. Peterson getting into their car and driving off. It is then shown that the couple hit a speeding pizza truck as their car becomes total. More importantly, however, it seems Mrs. Peterson got hurt in the accident as her husband lay next to her sobbing. The next dream sequence shows Mr. Peterson pacing back and forth in the waiting room of a hospital. A doctor can be seen talking to Peterson, but no dialogue can be heard. Judging by his actions, it seems she's passed away. The next few dream sequences are very hard to explain with words. I know the last two were pretty straightforward, but that just isn't the case for the rest. To avoid getting into theories, I'll leave you here. If you're intrigued, go play it yourself, or better yet, watch Mark play it or something. Something tells me this ain't gonna be too friendly a visit. The gameplay is just unenjoyable and confusing. Very unfortunate, since the storytelling is stupendous. We Happy Few has a few disturbing aspects about it. Due to the game's poor launch, I think it was actually overlooked, and we really didn't get a chance to explore those themes in greater detail. We Happy Few has a very unique story structure. Basically, you play through the main events of the game three times through the perspective of three different distinct characters. The ending of each of these chapters don't interact with one another. However, everything leading up to it, of course, does. The story takes place in a world where the Germans won World War II, and now everyone in the town of Wellington Wells is on a pill called Joy. It makes you hallucinate and damages your long-term memory and also makes you forget pretty much everything while you're on it. In Chapter 1, and for most of the game, you will be playing as a character known as Arthur Hastings, who is a censor trying to remove everything that references the lost souls and the children that were taken by train. Arthur was going to be one of those kids, however, throughout the story, we learn what actually happens and why he actually would want to forget. 
typically in action games, you want to root for the main protagonist, but by the end of this guy's chapter, it's kind of hard to give a flying shit for the man. Basically, Arthur has an autistic older brother whom he convinced to sneak onto the train with him, despite the fact that his older brother would have been far too old to even go. Instead, out of fear, Arthur took his ID and ultimately sent him to his death. Arthur's ending involves him remembering what happened in great detail and getting advice from the officer who ultimately let it happen. Basically, he's struggling with it and he's going to have to live with it for the rest of his life and that's the note that chapter ends on. In chapter 3, we return to a mentally damaged old fat diabetic old soldier named Ollie. He hallucinates that he's seeing this little girl. At the end of the game, Ollie learns that the little girl he was hallucinating this whole time wasn't his own daughter, but rather a TV personality known as Uncle Tom, someone who he hated for being a coward and a traitor. Ollie turned the poor girl in and she went on the train. Feeling so guilty about it, he took joy and alcohol in order to forget his past sins. His story ends with him exposing the truth and escaping on a hot air balloon, but not before saying goodbye to his past and learning how to truly move on. Just seeing Ali try to hold on to everything only to be forced to say goodbye to this little girl that he shared so much of his adult life with and much of our game with was heartbreaking. What do we do now? We say goodbye. To who? I'm not really your daughter. I know that. And I'm not really here. But... I'm a lie too. We've been together so many years. You don't think having an invisible friend is a wee bit babyish for a man who's been to war? We can hide in the train station till it all blows over. Now that you've put all that on the telly, I think it's time you put away childish things. You're right. You're always right. Goodbye, Margaret. Saying goodbye and the weight of that word is truly one of the most terrifying things a person can do. Saying goodbye to your brother who you know you won't see again, your past so that you can have a great future, and your friend who you eventually will grow out of. In the end, Goodbye means letting go of the weight on your shoulders, and it's terrifying. It's a change and no one can possibly know what comes next, but that's a part of the human experience. It's braving those changes, and We Happy Few shows us that. This is why We Happy Few is very, very flawed, but it's still an amazing game. It understands this much and crafts a truly disturbing story about the human condition. Detention is a Taiwanese survival horror video game created and developed by Red Candle Studios. It's a 2D atmospheric horror side-scroller set in 1960s Taiwan under martial law. The game incorporates religious elements based on Taiwanese culture and mythology, usually involving that of dark and creepy cults, and the plot goes on as follows. During the White Terror period in Taiwan, which if you don't know was a period of time where martial law was inducted due to civil unrest and many other factors that I do not have the time to go into, Wei Chung Ting starts to nod off in class. Due to an incoming typhoon, everyone quickly deserts the campus. I guess Wei is one hard sleeper because he wakes up to find himself deserted. Confused, he starts wandering to campus and hopes to find someone, rather anyone who can explain what's going on. He then encounters another sleeping senior student named Feng Rei Shin while running through the auditorium. They soon find out about the typhoon and realize that it's already hit, leaving the bridge exit flooded by the river. They then decide to wait out the storm in Wee's classroom. Wee decides to look for a phone before the game violently shifts to Ray waking up in the auditorium again. 
This time, it's in a Silent Hill-esque, Nightmares version of the school with Wee's corpse hanging upside down from the stage ceiling. Now, Ray wanders the rest of the school, avoiding different kinds of ghosts, solving puzzles, finding clues, as Ray's story is slowly pieced together. Ray was initially a talented academic achiever, but her grades began to slip as her parents' fighting grew worse, which is already getting into disturbing territories. We're talking about divorce and domestic abuse and... Oh, God. Ray's father would commonly come home drunk and throwing an overall shit fit while also physically abusing her mother. Uh, great. Ray's failing grades soon earned her a visit to the school counselor's office. She soon fell in love with Mr. Hugh, the school counselor. Uh, please note, senior students in Taiwan are usually 12 to 13 years old. Awkward. Well, Mr. Hugh's wife, a Miss Yin Hugh, found out and wasn't too happy about the situation. She soon confronted Chang as he agreed to stop seeing Ray, not knowing that she was eavesdropping and listening to every word. The very next day, he claimed that her grades have greatly improved and his services were no longer needed. This sent Ray into a spiral of depression and anger and overall desperation, believing the world wasn't letting her be herself and the devil to her hell being Miss Yin. After finding out about an illegal book club ran by Mishian, which we was a member of, she decided to steal one of the books and brought it to Bao Go Fong, a loyal veteran of China. For context, detention is set in the 1960s. At this time, Taiwan was under martial law by China. The government was eager to find and eliminate any support of communist ideas for people who didn't support China rule. Now, here's the generally fucked up thing about this game. Many books or material that can be deemed as communist would be outlawed, and transporting, smuggling, viewing, or even touching some of these illegal goods could be punishable by death. Many families just accused of such a thing could be put to death, which put a lot of people into a constant state of fear, hence the name, The White Terror. To make a long story short, Miss Yin escaped the country and Mr. Hugh ended up being executed in her stead, only leaving Ray to fall further into despair and depression because she inadvertently caused her true love to die by her hand because of a stupid mistake that a 12-year-old made in a state of genuine confusion. We and the other students involved in the book club ended up getting 15 years behind bars. Ray felt an extreme amount of guilt for her actions. She then decided to take her own life, leaping off the school building. The disturbing factor about this game is Ray's fight against her overwhelming feelings of grief and guilt and inadequacy that's starting to cause anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. Each monster she encounters is yet another hardship she must overcome, another emotional demon, and have greater symbolic representation in the deeper narrative. Her insanity taking the wheel as it tries to drive her subconscious off of a steep cliff is the true horror behind the tension. And I know this channel has said it before, but I'm going to say it again. If you or know anyone who's dealing with depression and or suicidal thoughts, please use the numbers on screen now. Suicide is nothing more but a permanent solution to a temporary problem. If you're willing to look, there is help. Nobody should have to deal with this alone. And let me tell you, no matter how alone you feel, you can never be alone in anything you're dealing with. Made by one person, Jasper Byron, Lone Survivor is a very interesting and creepy survival horror game that takes after the GameCube classic, Eternal Darkness. Not only do you have to be careful around the monsters that rest in the game's overworld, but also the trippy events that happen due to the deteriorating state of the main character's mind. Not only that, but the 2D art style only serves to enhance the psychological horror at play. Because everything is so abstract, it's hard to tell what anything is. Locations change depending on the character's mental state, which affects everything, from the monsters you encounter to the ending you end up getting. If you played an old Silent Hill type game, then you will be at home here as well. 
The whole time it's very tense due to the many monsters that reside in the dark apartments and eventually the city outside. In this game, due to poor controls, dispatching of the entities is something that's very difficult. The puzzles are not that good. Collect item Y, find door key X, get past obstacle Z, the typical trappings of the genre. What makes this game different is the fact that now you need food and sleep. If you feed him unhealthy food and keep him on drugs to stay awake, then yeah, he's going to be less mentally sound. However, if you take care of him, he does a bit better. Killing the monsters or stunning them also tends to have an effect on your mental health meter. In fact, quite a bit of stuff has an effect on this meter. In the end, this is a game about mental health, abuse, and pure horror. It uses these elements well, and through the use of good sound design, creepy visuals, it kept players unnerved. I've already talked about one of Red Candle's other games, Detention. However, this one is, uh, recent. In fact, I'm writing this right now as I'm also editing the rest of the video. I'm also physically unable to get gameplay footage that is my own because, as far as I know, I don't know if this game will ever come back to the marketplace. Reviewing this deeply disturbing game would be pointless as it's been lost due to political problems with Chinese censorship. Basically, a placeholder asset was left within the game, and it was politically controversial as it mocked the Chinese president, and as a result, had to be taken down with no certain future for this game. For those of you who want the spoiler-free version of this game, Devotion is a commentary on the rampant infestation of cults that lurk within Taiwan due to lax laws not really limiting their activities. On top of that, it's a disturbing tale about what happens to a father who loses everything and turns to a crazy religion for a attempt to pull it back together. Only problem is, is that in the end, it doesn't really work out for him, and he ends up losing what he has left. Red Candle games are deeply disturbing, as you can see by the gameplay footage I'm showing now. It's deeply rooted within the culture of Taiwan as a whole, and knowing more about these disturbing cults and furthermore the bloody history of the country will only serve to make their games even more visceral for the rest of you. I don't want to say much more about Devotion, because I hope it comes back that you guys will be able to give it a good long look along with myself. <laughs> it looks like you made it to the end of the video. Um, I hate to say this, but during the production of this project, I got laid off from my office job. So, I just wanted to let you guys know that Patreon is more important now than it has ever been before. Right now, YouTube is certainly paying enough to at least afford me to live from check to check. But right now, I'm in an incredibly scary situation. Regardless, your guys' support so far has been absolutely amazing. And if you made it this far, all I would like you to do is leave a comment letting me know you made it here and the, the call me a doofus or something. Mainly because I love it when I read comments where people are like, Oh, look, I saw the whole video. It's, it's, it's really encouraging and all that stuff. Right now, I'm incredibly nervous about the future, but I'm going to try to get onto a two video a month schedule and it's going to be like one short video, one long video. So that way you guys are always getting the type of content you want. And by the way, a short video on this channel is like, you know, 20 minutes. So it's not really that short, but you know, short for me. Anyway, thank you for watching and thank you for the support. You guys have been amazing for getting me through this. I mean, even now, it's all because of you guys that I'm not actually homeless right now. So, thank you. <laughs>